Hello, um, I'm Kevin from Birkbeck. Um, I'd just like to thank the organisers for their dedication for this session. It's two great friends, much missed by all of us at Birkbeck. Um, so I'm going to talk about some recent evidence from Nabro volcano in Eritrea. Um, we're going to look at the post-eruptive life cycle of this and some evidence from seismicity and code wave interferometry for possible movements of fluid beneath the caldera. So we're staying in the same region as the previous talk, which saves me a lot of time giving background. Um, Nabro is unusual, however, in that it's an oft rift volcano, so it's not on the main rift system. It's erupted for the first time in recorded history on 12th of June 2011. Previous activity has been dated for 23,000 years before this, so it's very unusual. Um, huge regional disruption, sadly at least seven fatalities. Um, what's particularly notable for was this vast quantity of SO2 that the eruption released. Um, this all summarised in a series of papers, particularly Berthe Goitem's paper, who collected the data that I'm going to be using. So shortly after the eruption, there were eight broadband seismometers were deployed around the caldera. Um, here's a picture of them being set up. Um, and these recorded for a period of 14 months after the eruption. So this gives us a really good chance to understand how a volcano recovers after it's had such a significant eruption. But the method that I use is called seismic ambient noise, which might be new to quite a few people in here. But basically, seismometers record all the motion on the Earth. It's not just earthquakes and volcanoes. If we go and have a look at the seismometer that our sponsors set up, outside conveniently you'll see it's constantly wiggling around um, now this gives this remarkable property that we can use a bit of maths to do and as a geophysicist it invariably falls to me to put the first equation up so apologies break your coffee soon um, if we cross correlate noise records between two seismic stations we can very accurately retrieve the impulse response of the Earth as if we'd set off a seismic source at one station and record it at the other, which is a game changer for seismology because it means that we don't need to rely on earthquakes or active source experiments. We can image wherever we want on the Earth just by placing our receivers in the right place. The other thing that this allows us to do is study seismology as a temporal change, not just doing images. So here I've got a um, a seismogram, this thick black line across the middle. Now, traditional seismic study is imaging tomography. We look at these direct waves that are in the early part of the seismogram after a source has gone off. However, if we look at the end of the seismogram, um, what's called the coda, these waves have been bouncing around in the subsurface for much longer. So they're very, very sensitive to tiny perturbations or changes in the medium that happen. Yeah, in response to the ground changing. So if we can build a reference state of the medium by taking, say, a year's worth of data, obtaining an average seismogram for what the ground would look like between two stations, we can then take a daily seismogram and compare the changes to see how it's changing over time. So that's what I did for NABRO. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, the resolution on this image hasn't come out very well on this projector. The online version is better. But this is what a year's worth of seismograms from NABRO looks like. So we can see they're basically the same all the way through, which is what we'd expect. There is some decoherence in July, which we'll come to shortly. But what we're looking at here is tiny changes in the coda waves. So variations here will tell us is the ground changing at small levels beyond what we'd expect from you know a big earthquake or anything what we what i've done is taken these daily changes and plotted them out as a time series of the how the velocities change against my reference over time and we see very nicely a recovery trend starting when the array was deployed right up until july 2012 so you can squint at that and look at this a straight line through it. Um, I've shown three different stacks here. This is basically just to smooth out the signal to noise ratio to make it a bit cleaner. The disadvantage here is that you lose some temporal resolution. So in my 
noisiest one day stacks, you can see there's a sharp drop immediately. That smooths out a bit at larger stacks. So um, this recovery trend is exactly what I'd expect to see. The volcano has had a huge eruption and then it's gradually the edifice is cooling, everything's contracting again. So the seismic velocity starts increasing as the ground becomes more compact. This big drop in July was unexpected. This would normally be from the literature, there'd be a big episode of seismicity or an eruption, something like that. We know that NABRO hasn't erupted again, so we need to look at an earthquake catalogue. Fortunately, an earthquake catalogue was published by Sasha Lappens um, shortly before I started looking at, at this. Um, if we look at this earthquake catalogue, here's a plot of the number of events each day that occurred during the 14 months this experiment was active. And there's one day that immediately leaps out as being there's a huge number of events happened on this day. We dig into the earthquake catalogue. This this sequence of events also starts with the largest earthquake recorded, which is a magnitude 4.4 event. If I lay over my time series over the top of that, we see, lo and behold, the velocity plummets at exactly the same time we get this huge earthquake swarm, which is very much as expected. So we've got the story of a recovering volcano. There's a big series of earthquakes that causes it to break a bit, and then the, the trend starts recovering again beyond that. We move on to what's the research and progress section of this talk. Um, the method I'm using is very much an array or a network method where you take lots of stations and you get a mean value across the array. But what we started looking at is, well, is there any spatial variation as well as variation in time to these velocity trends? Um, yes, appears to be the answer. So here I've taken two individual stations. So I've got four and three, which are up from the northwest kind of towards the east of the array and then five and eight which are down the southeast corner of the array if we look at the velocity trend here the green line is nab four and five shows a big drop on the first of july and then this gradual recovery whereas this station pair down at the bottom doesn't show anywhere near as big a drop and it also starts recovering much quicker which is interesting so i went back to the earthquake catalog here i plotted the individual earthquakes there's a lot in this catalog it's 34,000, so they're very small black dots um with all the events that occurred on july the first as these red crosses you can see there's a definite clustering effect to this um july the first swarm and you know, they're, they're all concentrated here and then moving down in this direction so back to our velocity trend, um, we can see that station pairs that cross this very active region of earthquakes on the 1st of July show a much steeper velocity drop, whereas station pairs that are quite far away from it show less velocity drop, possibly even an increase in velocity at this point. And then if we map this out to include more station pairs, um, here the bluer colours are showing a velocity drop whereas the more orange or red colours are showing a velocity increase we can definitely see station pairs that are crossing this swarm of events are showing a drop whereas on the edges of the edifice we're actually seeing a velocity increase in certain cases so wrap that up um, we see an expected recovery trend interrupted by a sharp decrease in relative velocity Drop in velocity is absolutely coincident with this 1st of July earthquake swarm. You know, it's, that's tied on. It's why is this velocity drop happened? Well, look, there's a huge earthquake event on this day. Um, the velocity change is strongest on paths that cross it, or it drops steepest on station paths that cross this earthquake storm, but is less pronounced or even reversed on station pairs away from the swarm. So possible causes, and this is very much an open question and why I'm here at VMSG to get ideas for this. Um, so this could be a fault reactivation, 
So an earthquake's happened, faults reactivated, a lot of instability. Structural and stress changes if there's been a big fracturing event or the stress fields changed. And I think particularly towards the southern northern edges of the edifice, we may be seeing this. Maybe if material shifted out. Or is this a migration of fluids? And this is where a purely geophysical technique like this cannot give us an answer. It's the non uniqueness problem. So we need other approaches to look at this. Um, other seismic approaches and also we can go back to the earthquake catalogue to look at the pattern of that, which is a teaser for Sasha's talk tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. <laughs>